Good morning to all of you participating from USA. Namaskar, vanakam to all of you participating from India. Welcome to Georgia Indo-American Chamber of Commerce COVID-19 series webinar, Impact on Immigration, Travel and Tourism. My name is SK Raj. I'm a member of the board and vice president of GIACC. I will be the moderator for this webinar. On my professional side, I am the vice president of an Atlanta-based technology company called 4R Tech. Today, we have three featured speakers and one guest speaker, Consul Silesh Laktakia from the Consulate General of India, Atlanta, Georgia. For those of you who don't know what GIACC is and what we do, GIACC is a nonprofit volunteer organization with a mission to promote trade and commerce between India and US, specifically the state of Georgia. We do this by hosting events like Indian Film Festival, Tourism Expo, hosting delegation from India, sending delegation to India, socials for members to network and working closely with Consulate General of India in Atlanta. Our members include small business owners, attorneys, bankers, and career professionals. Our sponsors include UPS and ICICI Bank. We also partner with other chambers like the Korean American Chamber of Commerce and Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, our event partner for this webinar. Now, I'd like to present today's agenda. The format of the webinar is as follows. I'll introduce our featured speakers, one guest speaker at a time, and they will present their subject matter for a few minutes. Thereafter, we'll open the floor for questions. We have a large number of participants today, and there's a lot of ground to cover. Please ensure your Zoom settings are the audio remains on mute and the video is disabled. If you have a question for the speakers, please send a chat message to me, only me, and I will post it to the speakers during Q&A. I cannot promise we'll get to all the questions, but I'll try. For your information, a recording of this webinar in its entirety will be available in our website www.giacc.net, not giacc.com, giacc.net tomorrow. Soon, you will also see their information on our next COVID-19 series webinar scheduled for June 3rd week. This webinar will address COVID-19 treatments, progress on vaccine development and long-term impact on workplace culture in both USA and India, among other things. A pulmonary specialist doctor from Massachusetts, a scientist from CDC Atlanta, or two of the featured speakers. Our first speaker today, Anita Nainan. Second. Anita Nainan will share US immigration updates. Anita has been an attorney for over 10 years, practicing law both at India and state of Georgia. She is the founder and principal attorney of Nainan Legal. She helps foreign nationals on visa, green card, and US naturalization matters. Ms. Nainan is the current chairperson of GIACC and serves as honorary legal advisor to the Indian Consulate General of Atlanta. Now, Ms. Nainan. Thank you, Raj, for your uh, kind introduction and a very warm welcome to all our uh, attendees, my co-panelists, both here in the US and in India. With fast moving changes in the US immigration landscape due to COVID-19, uh, I am planning to deep dive very quickly into some of the important uh, developments. 
uh, in this uh, US immigration uh, arena, impacting Indian employers and employees um, uh, 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 as a result of COVID-19. So to begin with, we have the US presidential proclamation, uh, which was uh, signed last month. And as of April 23rd, certain types of immigrants uh, face a temporary ban to their entry into the United States for a period of 60 days. Basically, an immigrant uh, who does not have a valid immigrant visa and a valid travel document, such as an advance parole document or uh, a boarding foil or a transportation letter, as of April 23rd, is unable to enter the US from April 23rd for a period of 60 days. There are certain classes of immigrants who are exempted, and I'm just going to uh, refer to those pertinent to our uh, discussion today. So US legal permanent residents uh, are exempted. Please note their uh, spouses and children are not, minor children are not. US citizens, their spouses and minor children are exempted. Uh, EB-5 visa immigrants are exempted. Uh, and um, uh, professionals, Indian professionals like nurses, physicians, doctors uh, who want to come in to help with the COVID response uh, in the United States are also exempted. Coming to uh, flexibilities and accommodations shown by uh, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services regarding petitions uh, and extension of stay or change of status here in the US, we find uh, a lot of Indian nationals have been stuck here in the US because of conditions back in India, unable to travel back. Uh, US uh, uh, CIS guidance uh, regarding this has been to timely file uh, extensions where uh, applicable uh, before the expiration of your I-94. Uh, as we know for the H-1 and the L-1 uh, category of uh, work permits, uh, they have an added uh, uh, immigration benefit of being allowed to work for another 240 days while their extensions are pending with USCIS. Um, uh, USCIS has also extended uh, uh, accommodations in terms of filings. They accept currently electronically reproduced signatures on all immigration forms and documents of wetting signatures. They have also extended uh, the time period uh, by 60 days for filing of uh, responses to requests for evidence and other notices such as notices of intent to revoke or notices of intent to deny. As regards the COVID impact on H-1B workers and employers and um, uh, L-1 workers and employers, uh, as you all know, I'm gonna first talk about the H-1B uh, work program. As we uh, know, it is a strict liability compliance program which is administered jointly by uh, USCIS and the US Department of Labor. It does require um, the H-1B employer to um, file certain attestations with the US Department of Labor regarding the terms and conditions of employment of an H-1B worker. One of these requirements is a posting requirement when an H-1B worker is hired. Uh, as we have noted and seen over the last a couple of weeks, uh, several states due to uh, lockdown um, requirements, quarantine requirements, have uh, uh, found uh, H-1B employees requiring to work remotely uh, from their homes. Uh, what uh, does this mean for an H-1B employer uh, in terms of meeting the statutory requirements, uh, uh, in terms of posting? Uh, very briefly, uh, where the new worksite location of the H-1B workers home is within the MSA or the Metropolitan uh, Statistical Area, uh, there is no requirement of a re uh, refiling of a new LCA. Uh, merely posting at the new worksite location will be sufficient. Uh, however, if the uh, new worksite location is outside the MSA, the H-1B employer has the ability uh, to use the short-term work, uh, worksite placement rule which uh, will enable uh, them uh, to uh, uh, continue working at their remote location, not mentioned on the LCA for about six weeks in a calendar year. Once that time is exhausted, uh, the H-1B employer must file a new LCA and an amended petition. 
As regards the L1 program, there are no such posting requirements. Um, what are the implications uh, for uh, H1B workers, uh, uh, employers, and L1 uh, employers um, uh, in terms of uh, reducing wages, furloughs, and terminations of uh, H1 and uh, L1 workers. As we know, COVID has had a huge impact uh, economically for companies. Uh, companies are trying to conserve their cash um, and trying to stay uh, afloat during these uh, very challenging times. Uh, in terms of reducing wages uh, under the H1B program, as uh, you may be aware, uh, the H-1B employer makes an attestation of paying at least the prevailing wage in the area of intended employment uh, or the employer's actual wage, whichever is higher. So there might be a little bit of wiggle room uh, as regards reducing wages of an H-1B employer during these times. Uh, however, uh, the wages should not be reduced at all below the uh, prevailing wage. As regards uh, changing from uh, reducing work hours, changing from uh, full-time to a part-time would necessitate an amended petition because this is a material change in the terms and um, uh, conditions of employment. Can an H-1B worker be furloughed and placed on temporary uh, absence uh, uh, leave? Uh, this would not be recommended because U.S. Department of Labor would uh, uh, view this as benching for unproductive time, uh, which is not 100% voluntary. Uh, so uh, that would not be recommended. As regards um, termination of H-1B workers, uh, I think it would be in this current environment, uh, the best uh, situation would be Either you pay the uh, H-1B worker throughout, uh, no furloughs. Anita, uh, no this is Anita. This is Raj. We yes. have a lot of ground to cover. I know the uh, the content that you have to share with us is very important. Can I request you to uh, continue yes. this during the Q and A session? I, I certainly will. I have two more points which I'll run through very quickly just on the unemployment insurance of uh, whether that is available for H-1B workers. Yeah, uh, they are not qualified to receive unemployment insurance because uh, under these programs, they should be shown to be available for work and due to their uh, uh, immigration status, they are limited from being able to claim that they are available and uh, for employment, to qualify for unemployment insurance. And the last point, of course, is uh, are they eligible for uh, the stimulus package and uh, the first uh, family's first coronavirus benefits if they are a U.S. resident and they qualify under the substantial presence test? Yes, they can um, uh, avail of these benefits uh, and not fall foul of the public charge requirements uh, under U.S. immigration law. And thank you so much. And I hand over to Raj. Thank you, Anita. Our now. Now, our guest speaker, Honorable Consul Silesh Laktakia, he will share with us consular updates. Consul Silesh is the consul for political and consular matters at Indian Consulate in Atlanta, Georgia. After a brief stint at Ministry of Commerce, he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1987. His diplomatic postings include Libya, Kyrgyzstan, Bahrain, and Mongolia. He has handled matters such as education, global cyber issues, commerce, and counterterrorism. It is with great pleasure I present now Consul Silesh. Give me just one second. Hello everyone, this is Shailesh Laktakia. I'm so honored to be a part of this webinar today with GIECC. And uh, I look forward to interacting with the uh, people who have joined this meeting and answer some of these questions uh, towards the end of the meeting. So the consulate is basically involved with consular issues, mostly with travel documents as far as the uh, general public is concerned. And uh, 
there are few things I would like to mention and bring to the notice of the people. As we all know, uh, because of the COVID-19 scenario, various governments have taken various actions. Uh, we know that there is a stay in place order, there is a lockdown, things like that. The governments do not want people to travel. As simple as that. Because when we travel, there are two things which can happen. Either we are a carrier, a known carrier, or maybe asymptomatic, so we can transmit our infection to others who may not be, uh, who may not have had this infection so far. Alternatively, or otherwise, we can get affected when we travel with other people, be it rail, be it air transport, be it a bus, or even a car. So transportation means that we are exposing ourselves or getting exposed to infection. We all know the coronavirus does not travel by itself. It is we who make the virus travel. If we restrict our travel, the virus's movement gets restricted. So it is in our hands to limit the travel of the virus to other people, other communities, other regions of the world, other countries. In this uh, 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 belief, various governments have come up with various things and Indian government uh, took a very hard decision to impose a travel ban on people uh, to enter into India. So nearly all of a sudden, the government decided that we cannot have foreigners coming in. Foreigners means anybody who is resident out of India at that point of time, even an Indian national. India has about 11 international airports and people keep trickling in from those airports into the country. People keep traveling out to various countries of the new world. Whether those countries are COVID affected or not, people do travel to remote countries, small countries, big countries, all kinds of places, and there is no control over this travel. So the government decided to impose kind of a entry ban on all uh, passengers coming by air. And this was uh, put in place in a very short time. So the government's intention was to control this infection so that uh, whosoever have had infection within the country, uh, the government is able to take care of them and try to minimize the spread of the virus, uh, try to minimize the communal spread, try to flatten the graph as soon as possible. So these were the actions taken by the government in the larger interest, both of the Indian nationals and of other nations also. The government decided that uh, the visas will no longer be granted. Visas which we have been issuing to foreign nationals for entering India, they were put on hold. And uh, if people insist because of some compelling reasons, very compelling reasons like uh, some uh, big medical emergency or a death of a close relative or things like that, in those scenario only the visas were granted. However, the big question remains and still remains that even if you uh, were to get a visa, uh, travel to India is not a possibility. So you can use the visa only when the travel restrictions are, are opened up and uh, people are allowed to uh, come into the country uh, by the land border or by the air, whatever. So even if you give the visa, uh, the travel is not a possibility. So people uh, have, have been uh, discouraged from applying for visa. And normal visa is in suspension right now. And this is a, a scenario which is likely to continue for some time till the government of India feels that it is okay for the foreigners to come in. Again, I say by foreigners means our own nations also to come in, in a way, the OCI holders also. So this visa session was placed not only for the foreigners, but also for OCI uh, cardholders who had some Indian connections, either they were India born or Indian parents and things like that. So even the OCI cardholders could not travel to India. And even right now, uh, there is a session on OCI cardholders that they cannot travel to India. However, because of compelling reasons, they can apply for a visa and get a visa from us if they have a very uh, big uh, issue at hand 
and we can help with that. But still, the possibility of their traveling to India will open up only when the government allows travel to India. So right now, the consular is dealing with uh, people who are applying for visas, and we are giving them visas only in a restricted manner. We are also dealing with uh, things like renunciation of Indian citizenship, which is a mandatory thing if you were to apply for OCI and for visa. And we are also dealing with limited number of uh, issue of passports or reissue of passports, I would say. Uh, that, that would help people either to get a visa, you know, from the USCIS if it is expiring or it would help in their travel to India. So the consulate is right now in a very, uh, in a very restrictive mode as far as functions concerned to the general public. Uh, so our consular functions are, are very limited to only for the emergent and urgent things. However, the consulate is open in general for the public to apply for various attestation of documents. That is normal. There is no walk-in, but people can send their documents by post. Recently, the CKGS in Atlanta has reopened. And I must say that, uh, again, in that facility also, there is no walk-in. Uh, people can send their documents they post to CKGS. CKGS will process it and send it back to us. Uh, and then we will process it further, whatever is required on our part. OCI uh, has silage, uh, yeah. The participants have a bunch of questions, and I know they all okay. want to ask okay. you so many questions. So okay. if you don't mind, I'd like to defer more content in the Q&A session. And okay. I trust me, there's just so many questions. Uh, and for I'm the information of all the participants, I to close. thank you. Absolutely. If you're not so, able to, if your questions are not answered during the Q&A, you can send a uh, email to us at yeah. GIACC at, pro, okay. at proapg.com and we will share that email in the webinar in one of the slides and then we will try to address it as well. Thank you okay. very much, Consul. And I, I would like to go to the next uh, speaker. Our next featured speaker is Purvi Chothani. She will share the Indian perspectives. Purvi is the founder and managing partner of Lock Quest based in Mumbai and Florida. In addition to practicing law in India, she is admitted to the New York State Bar and a practicing solicitor in England and Wales. Purvi is the vice chair of the India Committee and the Immigration and Nationality Committee of the American Bar Association. Purvi is the past president of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce Western Region. I now present Ms. Chotani. Give me one second. Let me locate Purvi. We have quite a few participants. So. Okay. Are we ready? Yes, Purvi. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Raj, for inviting me. And thank you, Anita, for inviting me to speak. And um, hello, everybody. So there's a lot happening in India. We are a huge country and uh, the government has a really challenging job at hand. Uh, I think that they, they are doing the best they possibly can because they don't have a blueprint of what works, what will not work, and we are struggling. Mumbai is seeing exponential growth in cases and um, is coming to our doorstep almost, wherever we are, it, especially in the city of Mumbai. Anyway, but the government has been very proactive, unlike other countries where they have uh, granted a lot of relief to foreign nationals who are within India currently. Uh, for example, they have given them an ability to extend their visas uh, even with delays and uh, extend their registrations even with delays within India by granting consular powers to the FRROs, that's the Foreigners Regional Registration Offices in India. That gives them a lot of flexibility in wanting to stay on uh, within the country. Um, OCI holders who are already within India are safe. They don't have any problem. Of course, those who are outside are unable to enter at the moment. Um, the 
other services also at the FRRO continue. So if you are here and you have to uh, apply for a visa or anything within the country, if there's a new birth or something like that, you can still continue to get that within, in, uh, within India. Um, even if there is a delay in any of the procedures, there is no penalty being levied for now. Uh, but um, that is also for a limited period, but the government has been extending the date uh, till when they will grant it um, every time they announce a lockdown. We are in lockdown version four now, uh, and they have extended the lockdown till the end of May. That's um, the end of the month. And um, the states have got the power to slowly open up how they want, and I will come to that in a bit. Um, the other situation that the foreign nationals are facing in India is they want to leave the country, but there are no commercial scheduled flights. So the consulates of their various nationalities are arranging for special flights to leave, uh, to take them out of India. Also, since May 7th, the Indian government has been operating uh, special flights to bring back Indian nationals to India who are stuck in various countries. They also had flights coming in and out of the United States and they have a few more scheduled right up to May 27th. Uh, after that, the schedule has not been fixed. Foreign nationals um, can't, I mean, they can get on these flights outbound, but they can't come into the country on those flights. Um, Indian nationals who wish to do so can register with their local consulates and they will get put on a flight. The consulate uh, approaches them with an email or a phone call and helps them get on the flight. We've had many clients come back like that. Once they arrive in India, they have to go into quarantine because of the lo lockdown and travel restrictions that the consular officer just now spoke about. Uh, so they will be put into 14 days of quarantine at designated hotels or centers. This is a service that they have to pay for themselves. Um, and then they can proceed to their uh, home destination. However, travel within the states is uh, between the states is also restricted. So people should be very careful when making plans to arrive in India because let's say they fly into Mumbai, they may not be able to um, travel to um, Uttar Pradesh or Madhya Pradesh from here. They'd have to wait. So other than that, there are restrictions in the states that are being opened up. Um, the, the whole entire nation has been divided into color-coded zones, depending on the in, uh, intensity and the uh, rate of increase of COVID cases. Mumbai is in a containment, uh, Mumbai is in the red zone, and many parts of Mumbai are in containment uh, zones. That's within the city, they are demarcated as highly dangerous. So the restriction on people movement is extremely high over there. There are police always monitoring, and we've got a um, night curfew also across, across the country, especially in Mumbai. Um, in the space of the employees, the government has proactively tried to protect the workforce. However, I'm not sure that's working fine. It might backfire. Uh, on March 29th, they, um, the Ministry of Home Affairs issued an um, announcement that they should not cut the salary of employees nor terminate their employment during this COVID situation. However, companies have gone to the Supreme Court uh, in special leave uh, petitions to, uh, um, to ask for relief on this because their argument is that if the business does not survive, how can we pay uh, salaries? So let us cut some salaries or let us cut some jobs and let us survive. The government has asked for time to answer those um, uh, petitions and those um, submissions made by the companies. And that's why there is a temporary injunction against the March 29th order. On the flip side, many IT companies who have workers on contract have terminated contracts. Um, and the NTIES, which is a um, trade union of uh, IT workers, has brought a case to the Supreme Court challenging these mass terminations. And the, that case is pending. So there is a lot of action happening at the employer-employee front. There is a tussle. Um, the other sad part of this entire thing is because we went to a, to a lockdown very quickly and suddenly, a lot of workers that are migrant workers within the country, with they come in from Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, to the large cities to work, they were all stranded in the city 
cities without work and really any home to speak of because if you're in the construction industry you're just sleeping at the construction site um, they many of them walked home and they walked home for miles and miles hundred plus miles in some cases so we've had some very tragic stories also about the workers uh, but I guess the government has a humongous problem they have announced some um, relief through their 20 lakh crore um, a plan for COVID relief, which is being distributed through various avenues. I just hope and pray that it reaches these migrant workers who seem to be the most devastated. Now, getting back to safety measure, work safety measures, most of the states have still got restrictions in the sense uh, Karnataka, which has opened up quite a bit because they did a very good job in containing the growth of COVID cases. They still have prevented schools, malls, theaters from opening and uh, public and religious meetings things from being conducted. So there are those restrictions, but general public is allowed Rumi, to move around. Sorry, yeah. to, sorry to interrupt you. As you can imagine, I'm yeah. getting so many questions and we would love for you to answer them. In sure. the interest of time, if you don't mind, I'd like to go to our final and fourth speaker, and then we will come back to all of these questions in the Q&A. Uh, right. If you want me to make one point on the data protection, that was my last point, but I leave it to you. Okay, can we do that in the Q&A? I'll be sure to address it. So, okay. Thank you. Our fourth and final speaker is Pabs Raghava. She'll talk about Indo-US tourism impact. Let me get that there. A tourism impact. Pabs is the CEO of Tours Limited, a premier destination management company based in Duluth, Georgia. The company's clientele includes customers from USA, Middle East, South Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Babs is very active in the tourism industry, including International Inbound Travel Association, Brand USA Mission, and the Indo-American Community Services, which is called IACS. Babs is also my fellow board member at GACC. I now present Ms. Raghava. Give me one second, let me look it, okay. Perhaps? Yeah, can you see me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and whichever part of the world everybody is joining in, we are having, happy to have you here on this webinar. Yes, as for the introduction, I do sit on the board of GICC and also in a founder of Tours Limited. Tours Limited primarily is a, um, you know, is a company headquartered right here in Georgia. And uh, we bring in passengers, thousands of passengers from India to USA, as well as from here to the rest of the world as well. So yes, indeed, COVID hit us really, really hard. As everybody knows, the travel industry is at a standstill right now. But uh, you know, this all happened March 15th. You know, up until March 15th, everything was looking so well. In fact, the year the tourism was really looking that it's going to be way surpassing 2019. But between the week of 20, uh, March 15 to 21st, when all of these things came you know, into view and everything, and we started getting so many cancellations, you know, people not sure what's going to happen. So month by month, we started getting cancellations, which is, of course, you know, very, very much expected in this kind of scenario. But uh, you know, so that is what happened. You know, we, we do corporate tours. We do leisure tours. We do all kinds of tours. But every section of tourism has been impacted so heavily with COVID-19 that it was something so surreal for us, you know, something which has never happened and everything stopped like in a matter of 48 hours, our business came to a standstill. But then, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. As far as the tourists coming from India to the USA, you know, they are mostly, they mostly come in as groups, as also as family groups, as also business travel and everything. But, uh, you know, so, but the, so group travel is a very favorite part of the Indians coming into the U.S. And we do provide Indian food on their tours. So that was the most exciting thing for them to come. But uh, the, the, the thing is right now, uh, you know, the, the many things are dependent on how this travel industry is going to pick back up. And 100% it will come back to its full swing and more. But we're just waiting for the airline pickup, you know, because that is very important because once all of these things settles down, 
as the U.S. cities are starting to reopen, you know, little by little, day by day, we are seeing some improvement. In the last 10 days, I would say that many hotels are starting to reopen with some of the COVID guidelines. So we've been getting emails from different hotels saying that these are the guidelines for the new COVID, post-COVID, you know, traveler. But, and also we are, Emirates, I think is, you know, thinking of starting their first flight back to USA on May 21st to Chicago. So there are certain sectors of the country which are more heavily hit than others. So for the business to work really, New York and Las Vegas has to reopen for us. And New York, of course, is one of the hot spots for this. So, you know, it's going to take a little time for that to happen. But I feel Las Vegas, there has been some movement, you know, in reopening the helicopter services open back up. I think some of the casinos are open back up with new protocol as to how they are going to run the hotel and casinos. So we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but, you know, we are not there yet. But, you know, we are excited because I think the new traveler post-COVID would see a cleaner travel platform, you know, when, when the flights would be more safer, more cleaner, the attractions would be more cleaner, the coaches would be more cleaner, the hotels would be more clear and clear. So that part of it excites because, you know, post 911, you know, the, the safest place was after you could clear security in the airport became very safe. So I'm thinking, you know, post-COVID, the safest place and the healthier place would be where everybody is tested a little bit to some extent, and at least we know who is sitting beside us may not have it. So, based on this, I know we are hard pressed for time. So I would take questions as they come along. But I, you know, I being positive and you know clear thinker, this is only a time thing. It's only a time bound thing. Once everything clears, people will start to settle. People will start to get confidence we will be rocking again. So looking forward to a great travel year 2021. So thank you all. And I would take any questions if you may have. Thank you, Raj, for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Pabs. Uh, I'm now going to get all our panelists on the screen. So just give me a second. Let me just do that. And then we can start the Q&A session. So. Okay, Anita, you should be on now. Let me get, okay. uh, let me get our uh, console as well. Okay, console should be on now. And I'm gonna get uh, poor V as well. Just give me one second and then we'll get started with the questions. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, that was definitely very uh, illuminating. I have uh, questions, a lot of questions from our participants. So we'll try to address as many questions as we can. Uh, so my first question is for Anita. So the question is, my client has a newly approved H-1B petition, but has not yet had the consular visa appointment. Do you think additional steps will be required as per the presidential proclamation, such as testing the job market through recruitment or other means before the visa can be issued? Uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, so uh, the, the uh, presidential proclamation is, uh, as of now, limited only to uh, certain classes of immigrants who are entering the U.S. It does not apply to non-immigrant visas. Uh, that visa, uh, you know, those who have valid uh, non-immigrant visas, like, um, you know, either work visas or uh, wanting to come in on a B1, B2 for travel or tourism, uh, if they do have a valid visa, they can come in and they are not uh, suspended during this 60-day period. Uh, uh, as regards any changes uh, in the H-1B program uh, requiring recruitment, that uh, would be a, a statutory change, and I don't think that would be covered under a presidential proclamation. I would also uh, um, uh, like to point out that the presidential proclamation does allow for uh, a review of the non-immigrant programs uh, within a 30 p a day period. And so this uh, week, we might be hearing something about the impact of uh, the uh, non-immigrant programs uh, and the possibility of uh, 
uh, any changes on those programs, including the H-1B, the OPT programs, and the H-2B programs, uh, in light of them uh, negatively uh, impacting the U.S. economy, given the high unemployment rates here currently. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. The next question is for uh, Consul Silesh. So the Indian government we hear is constantly moving the date farther to when things are allowed to return to normalcy. What exactly is the benchmark for the government to reopen the economy fully? Oh, that's a question for the economy. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, Raj, I'm quite ill-prepared for that. It may best be answered by some economist or people from the Ministry of Finance or things like that. You know? So, well, the, what, what we are trying to understand, the Council Silesh, is that we understand that the, the Indian government is saying that, you know, like the lockdown will continue until this month end, for example, right? So we are trying to understand what is the government waiting for to say, okay, now we can start opening the economy slowly because what we hear uh, from us back home from india is that it's being so that is the question if that makes okay. any sense uh, probably government is trying to play safe uh, as far the economy is concerned so this it's a very difficult choice you know either you play with people's lives and health or with the economy and uh, this is a balancing act which the government has to do very cautiously very carefully both ways you have disasters coming up. It could be the economic disaster, or it could be the health disaster. So the government has to find a midway, you know, somewhere it can balance uh, the rebound of the economy and somewhere it takes care of the health and security of the people. Uh, as far as we see, the IMF, the UN uh, UNACTAD, uh, they have projected the positive growth for India. Uh, during the next year and thereafter, even after the COVID-19. So India would be like one of the few countries in the world to still have a positive growth. So that is good news for India and it still keeps you know, our, our hopes high in the economy getting opened up. But the opening of the economy is going to take place uh, in a very calibrated, slow manner. Okay, thank you very much, Karsus. That certainly uh, helps. Uh, we have some more follow-up questions. I know a lot of people are asking about consular services and all of that. So I'll come back to uh, come back to you in a minute. Uh, this question is for Purvi Chotani. So Purvi, can an employee in India be terminated during COVID-19 lockdown? The follow-up to that is, can wages and work hours be reduced during the government imposed lockdown? So as per the March 29th circular, no, none of this is, is uh, permitted. Unfortunately, the government, the way they have worded it, they've called it an advisory. Uh, but because this advisory is under the Disaster Management Act, it has got the weight of regulation. And the, the, the announcement also said there will be penalties. So the simple answer is no, you cannot terminate or reduce uh, wages or salaries. But in practice, different things are happening. Companies are taking risks of penalties and going ahead and terminating. And I mentioned those two Supreme Court um, actions that are going on. There is, there is one where the companies are um, suing the government and there's another one where the trade union is suing the uh, companies. Okay, thank you very much, Purvi. Uh, this question is for uh, PABS. PABS, with raising income levels, particularly in developing countries, tourism has been growing healthily past several years. Everything has now come to a standstill. Post-COVID, what do you believe will happen to this industry? Okay, in my opinion, you know, nothing stays forever. Everything in, you know, everything in life comes and goes. So this is one of the phases we are going through. And, uh, you know, P once they, we have some definite vaccines in place, and also the airlines have their own protocol for safe travel, and every city is monitoring their attractions and hotels for some time till we get, you know, hold of this infection going on. And testing becomes quick and cheaper. And I think that would put a lot of things into perspective on the industry getting reopened. Travel is not something people are going to give up for anything. So it is only a phase we are going through and let's wait patiently through this. You know, it, we will get through this. 
and once we get through this and everything looks people will forget everything and start to you know travel back again so i have no doubt about that but 2020 in my opinion is is gone so i've taken it out of my calendar as far as you know any growth happening but i'm already seeing signs for 2021 people have started sending us some inquiries and people are excited to travel back up and every person i meet has this answer i cannot wait to get onto a plane to go somewhere so the interest is alive it's kicking we just have to wait patiently for a few more months and i think we'll be back to track thank you perhaps uh, we love the optimism you're sharing and we hope things will return to normalcy sooner than later all of us could use it i am sure you know everybody will agree with me that it is not just not the tourism industry or the market that's affected every one of us is sharing the pain so hopefully for all our sakes things will come back to normalcy sooner than later my next question is for anita anita can immediate relatives of a us citizen enter the us with an immigrant visa after april 2020 you're already in april 2020 so it's after may let's say after may or june <laughs> Yeah, so I think uh, what you need to uh, be aware of is uh, the only uh, immediate relatives who can travel back uh, would have to be the spouses or the um, uh, minor children. Children under the age of 21 uh, are exempted uh, uh, of U.S. citizens uh, during this uh, temporary uh, suspension, 60-day uh, period. Uh, unfortunately, parents of U.S. citizens uh, and immediate siblings of uh, U.S. citizens are uh, covered by the ban and cannot travel back. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. Uh, this question is for uh, Consul Silas. Consul Silas, will OCI, POI, and visa holders traveling to India be quarantined on arrival? Meaning, until what time has, has the government already put in place a, a plan to quarantine all travelers uh, as soon as they arrive in India? And what is the plan for that? Well, as of now, OCI cardholders, PIO cardholders, and visa uh, holders are not allowed to travel. Uh, as on date, only Indian nations are traveling to India and uh, through the evacuation flights. And they are being put in quarantine facilities for 14 days compulsory at their cost. So, even if we open up uh, this facility to, uh, to OCI cardholders, uh, I think the government will try to take some steps to ensure that uh, the infection does not seep in you know, somehow. And they may either be tested or put into quarantine, depending upon the advices given by the Ministry of Health of Government of India. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councilor Silesh. Uh, this next question is for uh, Purvi. What options does a foreign national have if his or her visa expired or is about to expire soon? So the good thing about India is that if you are within the United, if you are within India, you can file an online application to extend your visa with the FRRO and your uh, extension will be processed and approved online. No contact at all. However, if your visa has expired and you're outside India and you need to return to India either to work or visit for business or whatever reason, you will need to procure a new visa when the visa service is open. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Purvi. Uh, the next question is, uh, this question is for Pabs. Pabs, I'm getting a lot of questions from the participants on, uh, uh, you know, like travel. Like I have a question here for a, one of the participants says, I have to travel to India to meet my investors for a two week period. When do you see likely that happening? Because you know we know there's a two week quarantine and so on and so forth. So the question, let me just, I mean, you know, I'm gonna ignore all the specific questions which we'll probably share with you separately and make an answer. What are the changes that we, we see in people travel? I mean, when do we see things returning to normalcy in your opinion? I mean, what are you hearing from a tourism industry perspective. We've heard from uh, the consular perspective and how the governments are reacting. What do you see as a time frame for people being able to travel for their personal purposes? Yeah, I think it, you know, it's going to take a few months for some kind of normalcy to reappear again. 
right now you know i see there is a small you know small light you know in as far as some of the airlines have introduced a few dates in june where they will be operating some flights to some countries i got one such from i believe air india and also one from emirates so we are seeing some things happening you know british airways here and there maybe but you know nobody has given um like a schedule schedule it you know but but, but i do see some as i said my may 21st emirates is planning flights you know to a few countries which also includes chicago but uh, we have to wait and see for the airline to pick up and the countries to allow free flow of travel between the countries these two are very important in my opinion because without that people cannot come to a you know destination to do anything so the hotels and the, you know the attractions and the coaches and whatever the restaurants all of that is just a matter of following a protocol keeping their environment clean and you know making sure that you know they can you know can kind of contain this virus as much as possible but the main thing is the airline pick up and also the countries you know allowing people for, for free flow of travel to some extent so these two things i in my opinion i think it would take between june and july so i'm thinking by july 31st we should have a more concrete answer of what the next two months are very crucial okay thank you very much uh, perhaps that certainly helps uh, so this next question is for anita anita a lot of people are asking this question so i'm kind of going to generalize uh, the visa category uh, so we have students who have just completed their academic program we have uh, students you know uh, on opt cpt and they're all asking hey what happens if due to the lack of you know india has banned all inbound flights and so has us you know flights are very limited to international flights so what the participants are asking is what happens if my visa actually runs out while i'm still in us whether i am in f1 status you know f visa or opt sp you know cpt those status what happens to that because they all have a grace period of only like 60 days yes uh, so uh, for uh... Uh, it's important to know that the F1 status continues through the end of your OPT period, and you do have a 60-day grace period. If within that time uh, you still think you're not uh, able to uh, leave, depart the country, uh, that 60-day grace period, of course, allows you not only uh, to consider leaving the country or uh, to be able to change to another visa status or uh, to uh, enroll into a new uh, academic program. As of last week, there was an updated guidance from uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, regarding uh, uh, F1 students. And uh, uh, this particular issue as uh, for students who find themselves uh, uh, staying on here uh, beyond the 60-day period, uh, the guidance is that they should contact their designated school uh, officer uh, regarding alternate uh, study uh, arrangements and online courses that they could take. The other option, of course, for them to consider is uh, changing their status from F1 to B2, which, of course, will give them uh, a timely filing uh, before uh, the end of the grace period, 60-day grace period, will ensure that they can continue staying on until they're able to uh, depart the U.S. Okay, thank you, Anita. Uh, Consul Silas, this question is for you. Uh, we have a bunch of questions from uh, participants asking about consular services. Many of them are asking, you know, when can I apply? My passport is expiring. My visa is expiring. Uh, what is the process? You did address it during initially uh, in the initial part of the webinar, but can you give us some insight onto when your consular services and consular matters will will resume normally? Well, consular services were always there, although in a small form, and they are being slowly opened up for the people. Uh, we have no idea when they will be in full swing, but as of now, people who need visa can still apply, and if they have a compelling reason to go, we can give them a visa. The question still remains, how will they travel to India? So it's up to them to make arrangements for their travel. As far as passports are concerned, people who are having passports running out of their valid dates, they can apply for passports, new passports, and we can give them passports. People who have come on like uh, uh, on a B1, B2 visa as a visitor, and uh, they hope to go get back to India in about 15 days time or a month's time, but they have somehow 
continue to stay here because of the COVID-19. And uh, if their passport is expiring very soon, like in a month or so, we can help them get a new passport provided their uh, security features, you know, related features are clear, you know, antecedents are clear. So that is one way where we can certainly help people. And people can get their attestations done, like power attorneys, will, uh, affidavits, etc. cetera. Uh, there is no walk-in, but people can still apply uh, through the post and get it done. And people are already doing it. CKGs is also open. As I said, it is, there is no walk-in in Atlanta and elsewhere, but uh, people can send their docs by post and they will get their services done. Thank you very much, uh, Council Silas. Uh, this question is for Purvi. Purvi, this, uh, this is an interesting question that uh, will be very relevant to, to India. And, and of course, we from US also are very interested because a lot of us have uh, relations in, in India, both uh, you know, professionally and, and also on a personal level. So in, in US, if uh, you know, employees right now are following and they're also letting go, and there is a social system here to take care of them, there are uh, uh, obviously stimulus checks and so on and so forth. Employees in India, thanks to the COVID-19 situation, are allowing employees to work from home. So by Indian laws, are employers obligated to continue giving benefits and how should employee allowance be treated? So they have to continue giving the benefits and allowances uh, exactly as they were giving it before. So in India, the salary is very often broken up into travel allowance, dearness allowance, um, and various heads uh, due to tax planning, etc. But whatever it is, even if it's travel allowance and they're not traveling to work, you still have to continue paying them their emoluments. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Purvi. That certainly helps. Uh, this question is for Pabs. Pabs, I have a lot of questions on folks asking about uh, travel that they had already planned. So some questions are, okay, so I have planned my travel, COVID-19 hit, my travel is canceled. My airline is giving me a credit voucher and they're kind of forcing it on me. What are my options? Can they impose the same one year credit, you know, the, the voucher limit? Can I get a full refund? So what are the questions? What do you see in your industry in terms of airlines uh, you know, either giving refunds or honoring vouchers and, and what changes do you see because of the COVID-19 situation? Yeah, good question. You know, the airlines have been very, very accommodative throughout this whole thing. Yes, there has been a challenge in trying to reach them even for us, you know, because I can understand the amount of volume of calls and everything. Everybody has to be a little patient and understanding that the whole world came to a standstill in a matter of 48 hours. So that is going to take some time on them, but on their part, they have been telling people that go to our website and, you know, if for instance, Delta and, you know, different airlines have been sending emails, you know, what are we, our vouchers are good for this, good for that. They have been extremely accommodative. I don't think there is a cause to worry on that, you know, as of now. And yeah, they are giving vouchers and I think few of them have given a refund here and there, but most of them have been gone the route, voucher route. And so I think if you hold on to your voucher and their future plans change and as it changes and the, as the economy opens back up, as if the travel becomes a little more easier in, in terms of all the lockdowns and everything that we have, I think you'll be good to go. So to just hang in there, let everything open up, you know, as far as countries opening up borders, as far as airlines, you know, getting on to their pickup, you know, and, and the flights resuming itself and so on and so forth. I think the money will not go anywhere because most airlines have done a very good job of giving the voucher and making sure to make the passenger understand that, hey, you know, we are not running away. It's only a matter of time you will travel again. So I think on that accord, I don't think right now it's a worrying situation. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pabs. Uh, I thank all the panelists. I would like to request uh, Naushad Panjwani. Give me one second. Oops. Uh, Naushir Panjwani, uh, the regional president of IACC, to propose a word of thanks. Yes, Raj. Uh, thank you, Raj, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm very happy that our two chambers collaborated. And uh, it was a pleasure listening to these four distinguished speakers, uh, Council Shailesh, uh, 
gave his perspective and uh, that comes with a lot of authority and we get the official view. Uh, Ms. Anita, Ms. Purvi and Ms. Pabs give a wonderful disposition from their personal experiences and the way they handled the questions was amazing. Uh, Georgia and India uh, are, are very well connected as we all know. Uh, we have so many companies operating uh, in Georgia, Indian companies operating in Georgia. Uh, we have a, a large uh, expat population here. Uh, I'm very happy that we joined hands and did this conference. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank Raj. Uh, you conducted this uh, webinar so beautifully, so professionally uh, that we were able to answer so many questions, get, get the views from all the participants and uh, we managed to keep time. Thank you so much. Thank you all the participants. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, being part of this webinar. Thank you, Naushad. And that concludes our webinar. And before we conclude the webinar, I'd like to remind all of you, again, if your questions were not answered in the Q&A, very sorry, but please do send your questions to that email ID that we shared through the chat, and we will try to get the answers directly from our featured speakers. And do check the website at gacc.net for the next webinar series coming uh, in June third week. Thank you very much. And, and you will see a recording of this at our website and you can uh, uh, access it tomorrow as well. Good night to those of you from India and good day to all of you from USA. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.